Hello, welcome back again. So our last episode, how I became a citizen, I uh, had a lot of questions. A lot of people reach out to us asking about the visa process and how to obtain and what like the different types of visa, etc. So we decided to put together an, a second episode uh, and interview my good friend Eduardo Otero, who is an immigration attorney. All right, and uh, he helped me through the whole process. I was lucky enough to meet him the first week I landed in the United States. And he also uh, has a house in Barcelona, speaks Spanish, became friends, and he was really, really helpful. So we asked him if he could uh, put some time and answer some of the questions we have. So this is Eduardo. I'm an immigration lawyer in uh, Philadelphia. Although I came to the United States at 18, I'm a U.S. citizen, I was born in the United States, but I grew up in South America. So I always had a, a special connection with people that came from abroad to the United States, looking for better opportunities, looking for education, mm -hmm. looking for jobs, whatever it may be. So after college, I worked for a, a nonprofit organization in Washington, and we represented uh, Chilean refugees. They were coming from uh, the time of the Pinochet regime, and there was a high influx of Chileans uh, escaping persecution and oppression in Chile, and they were in Washington, D.C. And I became very interested. Uh, after that, I decided to go to law school. Uh, I came to Philadelphia, and I started working with immigrants soon after graduating from law school and passing the bar. So obviously one of the first questions that we had for Eduardo was to kind of explain all the different types of visas that there are and how you would obtain them. Well, in immigration law, there's a whole variety of ways that somebody can come to the United States. Mm -hmm. Or an A visa for diplomats, B visa for tourists, C visa for crew members, uh, E visa for investors. So you also have the investor visas whereby if you invest a certain amount of money in the United States or in an existing business that's failing and you promise to bring it up and create employment for, the, for this failing company, also based on treaties, uh, different investment treaties that certain countries have with the United States. Then you have the F, which is student visa. You have to be enrolled in a full-time academic degree. Mm -hmm. You can do high school, but also mostly as college student. You have to come as a full-time student to obtain a college degree. And you have to make sure you attend all your classes, make sure you your grades are up to par. Because actually, if you don't participate in classes, if your attendance is very low, or if your grades are not what to keep you in the academic program, uh, actually your visa will be uh, terminated and you could face deportation proceedings. The H, which is a professional uh, worker in a professional position, a lot depends on what the United States needs as far as uh, employees to come to work here. There's something called STEM, which is science, technology, engineer, math. Mm -hmm. Those are actually categorized as the most needed background education that the United States is now uh, in need of. So those professions usually take prevalence over others. It's much harder to say somebody like an accountant or in marketing, uh, even for a lawyer, it's a little bit harder because to prove that they're not Americans that are, can do that job, but there's not enough Americans with that kind of degree, it's very difficult to prove. Now, somebody from Spain, do you actually, as an architect, was able to uh, get your work visa working for an architectural firm? It's a position that requires extensive education and mm -hmm. knowledge, and that's what the United States looks for. I mean, we're, we look at unskilled labor and skilled labor. They're both categories. We also need a lot of unskilled labor, uh, farming, construction, and, and, and unskilled. There's a skill, of course, but it's, that's the way it's categorized by the, by the government, by the law. But the skilled labor is mostly what attracts those work visas. The J-1 visa is an exchange program visa. It's used mostly for um, programs from fellowship as a medical doctor to an au pair. So it's a very umbrella-like visa where it covers not just one specific profession or one sector of the economy, it covers everything. 
and is usually limited to two years, and you then have to go back to your home country for two years. There are some exceptions to that, and uh, it depends on where the funds come in, if the government funds that sponsor the program, if they weren't, uh, there are certain technicalities to that. The K was the fiancé visa, and it's kind of the, the reality show. 90 Day Fiancé. Oh yeah, there's a lot of uh, funny stories with that, if you can say <laughs> that. And I think from that show, you can perceive a lot of that. <laughs> An M visa, which is uh, usually for artists, and they're usually sponsored, or most of the times are sponsored by museums, mm. the Smithsonian. So there are mostly people in the arts that will come to um, do a project if they're doing a mural, or if they're teaching at the Smithsonian, or the curators that come, may come in for an um, exhibit and they stay here for six months or a year. So they have those cultural programs too, that you get a visa. Then you can have an O, which is mostly for a certain expertise for very high-end PhD researchers or somebody that's going to come at a university who's done a lot of advanced research in a certain field and that university is interested in bringing this person to do the same work in the United States. Medical doctors doing fellowships sometimes. L visa is for multinationals. So for example, you are working for a multinational corporation, like a large pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. So they're headquartered in the UK and you've been a manager or a director at uh, the company at the multinational in the UK and they want to send you to Philadelphia for a period of time to perform a director or a managerial position. You can actually move from the UK to the United States uh, with an L1 visa. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly for companies that have a headquarters abroad and a subsidiary in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the P visa, which is for athletes or musicians. So if you are the Rolling Stones and you want to come and tour the United States, the set designers, the lighting folks, the sound folks, the sound engineers, or you come to play uh, basketball in the NBA and you're from Spain. Then you have the R visa, which is for religious workers. So if you're a priest or if you're a minister or if you're the Pope <laughs> and you come and perform religious services at a Catholic church, for a extended period of time, he would do have to apply for an R visa and mm -hmm. he would probably get it, being the Pope. Mm -hmm. S visa, which is for uh, uh, witnesses uh, brought in by the federal government to witness in a criminal case. Uh, you have a T visa, which is just a visa when you're in transit in the United States, which many of us, if you travel abroad, sometimes you're in transit, but you may want to stay for a couple of days. And then you get a U visa, which is victims <laughs> of a crime. Uh, so those are folks who are in the United States, whether they have a visa or if they're in no status whatsoever, if you're undocumented in the United States, but you're a victim of a serious crime and you cooperate with the police and the authorities, the visa was based on the fact that the law enforcement noticed that immigrants, and especially undocumented immigrants, were victims of crimes and there was a, in high proportion and they were not reporting the crime out of fear that if they reported the crime, the authorities would know who they are, that they were here undocumented and they could be deported. Mm -hmm. The perpetrators would obviously know that they were not gonna be reported to the police or these people would just quiet down take whatever happened, the, you know, be victims, but not do anything about it. So Congress wanted uh, these folks to actually feel encouraged to report crime, to cooperate with the authorities, and in that you will be mm -hmm. rewarded with uh, a visa that will lead to a green card. Then you have the family. So most people actually come to the United States through family members. You can always petition for family members in anywhere in the world. And uh, you could be your sister, it could be a parent, a spouse, or a child. And those folks, which are called immediate relatives, get the benefit of coming to the United States because one of the relatives, immediate relatives, is a U.S. citizen or a green card holder. And that's probably the vast majority of immigration that you see in the United States. We've kept a long history of family unification and just like our ancestors and 
many Americans' uh, ancestors. They came here through family members. The, the brother petitioned the brother, the father petitioned the kids, the kids petitioned their parents. A lot of uh, people that have been here for hundreds of years came that way. And then you have another option which um, has a lot of uh, talk nowadays, which is the asylum process, which is how I started my career uh, representing refugees and asylees in the United States or asylum applicants. And that's another way where people can, can come to the United States if you can prove that you have what's called a well-founded fear of persecution if you were to return to your home country. Which as we know, the United States is right now in a small crisis, a refugee crisis at the southern border, where Texas, Arizona, California have seen a high influx of, of immigrants, uh, mostly from Central America, but now you have them from Haiti, from Cuba, uh, from Venezuela, just uh, fleeing persecution, fleeing uh, the unsafety of those countries and the lack of protection that they receive from the governments. So that has been an issue that the administration has been dealing with and has been very recent in the news about what the Biden administration is trying to do with that and trying to prevent this kind of influx at the border. Unfortunately, with that comes along a lot of um, criminal activity. So you're not only in the business as a smuggler of humans, but also there's drugs, there are weapons being smuggled from the United States into those countries. So it's become uh, a very criminal business in a lot of ways. But that doesn't take away from the people that are victims of traffickers, but are also desperate to come here and, and try their best to come to the United States to seek their safety of our country. And then I cannot think of anything else. I think that's pretty much all the ones that really matter. I'm sure I'm missing a couple. Yeah. Another question we had was how much time you have to leave the country if a visa expires. You usually have a certain amount of time to leave, but yes, once your, your visa ends, whether it's a student visa and your academic program has ended, and actually students get an extra year, so when those extra years ended, or let's say you're here on H1B and you are, uh, your job is terminated, or you're up, uh, the, cat, the limit is six years and you complete your six years here, then you have to leave, yes. Usually you should leave by the time your visa is expiring or before. Um, some visas have a grace period, very few, that you can leave afterwards. You don't want to stay, overstay your status. You always want to respect the term limits, the date limits that immigration gives you. So yeah, so in most cases, you would have to leave. And you usually have 30 to 60 days, but uh, you gotta be careful with that. It's not in the law. It's almost common practice that if a U.S. embassy sees like, oh, you overstay your visa more than, you know, you you pass the, the last day of your visa and you left 30 days later, what happened? You know, well, I was trying to get organized, you know, I couldn't get all my bags together and I had to rent my apartment or sell my house or whatever. All this stuff happened the last minute and obviously I couldn't leave when I should have. But it's not, they don't have to. If you, if they want to be very strict about it and be very harsh about it, they can say, nope, you overstay your visa. Now you're not eligible for any other visas except the green card. Eduardo mentions that there is a cap in some of the visas. Our question for him was, who instated the cap? That was uh, done during uh, President Bush. Yes, so the government, the, the federal government can impose caps on certain visas. He might be somewhat obsolete at this point because we clearly need those kind of workers. And uh, I think if the companies are in demand for technology and for folks with high experience in programming and computer engineers, if this country needs them, I don't see the point of capping that number. I mean, it only, it's only gonna help all of us. It's not just helping the company or the foreign national that comes in. If you look at all the ramifications that go around a successful business, you'll see jobs created in many other ways for Americans. So in a sense, to, to stop the technological development of this country, because you want to cap immigration numbers, you're kind of showing yourself on the foot. 
because eventually the United States is going to need mm -hmm. this great foreign nationals with great experience, with great education to come and give us some of their skills and knowledge to enhance our technology, which is going to benefit us, all of us. We have an issue with the immigration law these days that we can see right now at the border where there's not a really organized fashion to emigrate to the United States and that's created a lot of this illegal immigration. So my thought has always been to create a visa that will allow people temporarily to perform a job, to pay taxes. We have to keep in mind that a source of revenue for this country would be for a lot of folks who are now undocumented and working what's called under the table for them to become taxpayers. They're not displacing American workers. A lot of these jobs, Americans are not willing to do. But uh, for me, it's very important to have immigrants, not only for work, but also the multicultural nature and fiber of this country. We're a multicultural nation, and that's what made us mm -hmm. such a great nation. Yeah. We have historically been able to export our, our, our knowledge, our products, because of multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. We're able to relate to the world because we are the world in one country. This is not a homogeneous, just unique to one race, religion, is everyone. And when you have everyone in one place, you export, you transmit that sense to the rest of the world. And I think a lot of American dominance in, in, in the last century or two, century and a half, has been that multiculturalism. We've been able to relate to everyone in the world because we are, in one sense, included in the world here. So I think immigration is very positive and I think immigration should not have the stigma or the negative connotation that it has today. Uh, I think people should look at it as a positive I know most immigrants come here to work and do honest job for honest wages. Uh, they're not criminals. They're very much family oriented folks that are here because of fear for the safety or for an economic need. They need to support their families when they can't do it at home. Some of my clients work two, three jobs. I admire them for their work ethic and their resilience and their ability to overcome many barriers that are placed to begin with when they come into this country and they overcome those barriers to be productive members of our society. So instead of looking at them with a certain uh, mistrust, we should look at them as an example of what this country did at one point. Mm -hmm. We were those immigrants at one point and we overcame the obstacles that we had in this nation and became what we are today. And I think we should give those folks the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. As long as they respect the law, as long as they're law-abiding citizens, as long as they follow a certain process, and as long as they accommodate and join our culture, our society, I think that we should be welcome them. I admire also their, uh, their faith in themselves. They overcome obstacles from the moment they leave their home country to the moment they land in Philadelphia, New York, Miami, wherever they're going. They've overcome things that we can't even fathom. You understand the necessity and the need to improve your life, to become a better person, to be able to help others. And the only way that they can manage to do that is coming here in any means possible. So even though I am not in any way encouraging or, or, or accepting illegal immigration or to break the laws to go into a country, I do admire the fact that, that when, when that's done, when the legal part is over and you go into the more humane part, there are great human beings. There are people that are here to cooperate, to collaborate and also they're very thankful to this country. When those opportunities to, are given to somebody in despair, I guarantee you, you're gonna have very, very loyal, faithful US citizens in the future because their gratitude is enormous. And they feel that this country saved their lives and the lives of their relatives left behind. 
this folks is not just a number, is not just this person that's a lawbreaker who's taking advantage of a system. It's somebody who's actually has a background, a history, and who's willing to risk everything to improve their future and the future of others. As we mentioned in our previous episode about all of our personal experience with immigration, it can be a very stressful process. So we asked Eduardo a little bit about the different experiences that he's seen with his clients and also what it's like to be an immigration attorney and stress level involved with that. It is very stressful, yes. Yes, because you, at all times you know that somebody's life, somebody's livelihood, somebody's family depends on the work that you do. So it is a lot of pressure. And unfortunately, not everything is in my hands. A lot of it is in the hands of the government and their decisions. And sometimes they're not consistent. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't get a lot of guidance as to how things are being decided or the decisions that are being made are political instead of legal. Their future is up in the air when things don't work out as they expect them to, mm -hmm. or as they should. So yes, for them it's very stressful. But like I said before, I find clients to be very hopeful, very positive, and it's encouraging to see their positivity despite all the obstacles and they're willing to overcome them. Mm -hmm. So I respect that a lot. All right, this is it. I hope this was helpful and it uh, throw out some of the questions that you may have had. And this is it for today. I will see you in the next episode. Adios. Ciao.